to Acts chapter 4, or Acts chapter, I'm sorry, 5, Acts chapter 5, uh, but then also Acts chapter 20, Acts chapter 20. Acts 5, Acts chapter 20. A couple Wednesday nights ago, we started uh, teaching on the doctrine of soul winning. And uh, we kind of, I think, had a, a speckle of, uh, of folks in here, and you may have been here for that. And then last Wednesday, we continued that, and we got a little bit further. And then I intend to get a little bit further uh, tonight. I intend to try to catch everybody up that was not here on those Wednesdays or was serving in a different ministry and uh, continuing uh, the doctrine or the teaching of personal soul winning. And I thought it appropriate as we've concluded our missions month and we've been challenged to do more for the cause of Christ and evangelization and, and then practically speaking, um, we should consider ourselves, obviously. We should, be, we should be doing what we're paying others to uh, be doing as well uh, those are missionaries. And so we, I don't want you to look at it. I'm sorry I phrased it like that. We're not paying them uh, to do something. We are investing in their ministries, okay? Let me clarify that, all right? We don't, we don't hire them and, and fire them. We, are, we have the privilege and blessing to be able to contribute uh, to those ministries that we support, uh, those, uh, those different missions, uh, endeavors, missionaries. And so uh, the doctrine of personal soul winning, Acts chapter 5, verse 41, the Bible says, and they departed from the presence of the council rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for his name. Have you done that? Anybody else? Has anybody had that happen before? And daily in the temple and in every house, they ceased not to teach and preach Jesus Christ. Acts chapter 20, and then look at verse number 20 as well. Acts chapter 20, turn a few pages over. See the example here of uh, some of the early churches, the disciples here. And Acts chapter 20, verse 20, it says, And how I kept back nothing that was profitable unto you, but have showed you and have taught you publicly and from house to house, testifying both to the Jews and also the Greek, to the Greeks, repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord, uh, Jesus Christ. Now, um, understand, understand, I think you do too, this was not necessarily, uh, yesterday several of us went out and um, some of us hit an apartment area with gospel invitations and invitations for the Easter egg hunt, and then some of us went to a different community where it was more uh, sidewalks and you had to do more walking and we got more exercise because we're stronger and stuff like that, <laughs> but uh, no. Um, kind of, <clears throat> um, but uh, not that we're stronger, but uh, we had different uh, areas and we were able to talk to some people. I don't think I, we talked to anybody, but I know people were able to talk to people. Uh, people were able to share the gospel at their house publicly and from house to house. Now, I don't believe they were going with gospel tracks door to door like we did yesterday, uh, but nevertheless, the principle is there. They went publicly from house to house and they were preaching and they were teaching Jesus. I envision them having Bible studies, having, having a book of Isaiah perhaps, and, and opening the scriptures and expounding on uh, the Messiah, uh, that he had come and, and, and such and things like that. And so um, we're gonna talk about the doctrine or the teaching of personal soul winning. Let me pray, we'll get right into it here. Father, I need you. I pray that you challenge us in this area. Uh, Lord, this is such a... a an important area in Christianity, Lord. May we be like you in, in this capacity. May we be conformed into your image in this area of soul winning and personal evangelization. God, may we have your heart. You came to seek and to save that which was lost. You came to save them. And if you went about doing this, Lord, we need to, you've commanded us to do it as well, to tell others about you. May we be fervent in our, in our sharing of our faith, in our communication of our testimonies, and in our faith in you. Uh, Lord, I need you. I pray that you teach and preach through me now. Amen. Bringing people to Jesus ought to be a priority of every serious Christian's life. It's part of what growing in the knowledge and, and grace of our Lord is, uh, is all about. It's one aspect of that. 
And uh, <clears throat> so um, God has commanded us that we're to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. One of the venues or ways by which we do that is we support missionaries into regions all over the world. We support them here at this church on a monthly basis, and uh, we we prayerfully support them. We don't just send money at them, but uh, we take time and read their updates, and we want to pray for them, any prayer requests that they have, any struggles and obstacles that they have. If you think you've got attacks of Satan here, um, there are countries that uh, would blow your mind and the spiritual attacks that they have in, in the different capacities on how they live. And I know uh, the, the peaches can testify of being in a, a third world country and, and uh, certain parts of Hawaii where we were seemed like third. Uh, I've been to uh, Ghana, and so I've seen some of the aspects of it there, but but, but there are areas of Hawaii, as Brother Todd showed his video of how he got to minister in, in Hawaii in a certain area there. Um, no doubt the devil attacks. The devil doesn't want people saved. Amen? We understand that uh, truth here. Uh, the devil doesn't want people to trust Christ as Savior. He wants to blind us. He wants to blind them. And so uh, we are commanded to go into the world and preach the gospel to every creature. And so the avenue by which we do that into, into the uttermost parts of the world is by supporting missionaries. But then we're also supposed to be witnesses here. And God has given that command to the church, the local New Testament Bible teaching. Uh, a, 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 a good Bible teaching church is going to be evangelizing. And uh, it's, it's one of our responsibilities that we have um, as uh, children of God. We've tasted, we've seen that the Lord is good. If you've trusted Christ as Savior, then, then that is the greatest decision that you can ever make, and we shouldn't hold that to ourselves. We ought to let that light shine so that people can get saved as well. Uh, Jesus had told uh, Peter, he said, when he, when he saw him fishing, he said, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. Uh, Brother Randall made a point this past Wednesday. He said, um, there's, there's a couple of uh, thoughts behind that verse there. If you're not winning people to Christ, if you don't have the desire to lead people to the Lord, tell them about Jesus, it may be that we're not following him. Maybe that we're not followers, period. But it may be that we're not following him. Jesus says, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. It's a responsibility uh, that we have. And um, I like that illustration. I like that comparison there about being a fisherman, being fishers of men. Um, I like fishing. I think it's challenging. It provides food for the table. It's uh, different fish or different uh, challenge levels and such. And I've caught all different kinds of fish, I think, in my life. And I don't know how many different species. Brother Todd has it uh, memorized, how many different species he's caught. Um, I'd like to do that sometime in my life. But in our old uh, pond in Newberry Springs, California, we had a uh, fish, a catfish, a, a bull, what was it? A bullhead catfish that I had caught and I let go in our pond there and we called the thing Jaws. It was, it was a big catfish, you know, being little, it was probably uh, exaggerating. Now, looking back, probably if I had caught that fish, if it wasn't dry, it probably would be only like that big. But no, we used to... I caught that fish, and then all the cousins would take turns catching that fish. Usually, we'd get together at Thanksgiving, Christmas time, all the holidays and stuff, and you'd always have a cousin or two out there on the dock fishing, and we caught that Jaws catfish uh, time after time. We, got, we had pictures with it. Probably every cousin has a picture with that catfish. Um, <clears throat> but, um, but anyway, fishing is fun. Fishing is challenging. I remember one time fishing with my uh, grandpa, I think it was, or my dad, one of the two. And, and uh, when, you, when it go, comes to fishing for catfish, now basses are a little bit different. You can fish with bait. You can fish typically top water or jigs or something like that is what you want to use for like a bass. You cast it out there and then you kind of slowly reel it in, kind of get the fish to uh, be interested in that thing. And so you're constantly casting and reeling typically, casting and reeling. But when it comes to catfish, catfish are bottom feeders. And so uh, you load up the hook, uh, typically with the bait, you cast it in, and you let it sit. Then you wait. Well, 
kids get impatient, right? And so I'd be fishing with my grandpa, fishing with my dad, and, and I'd want to reel that thing in every, every five minutes or so to check the bait. Sometimes the bait, you could tell, had been nibbled on. Sometimes it was still there. And, and, but uh, my impatience led me to reel that thing in time after time. And then one of uh, either my dad or my grandpa, I can't remember which one it says, probably both of them, they said, uh, you're not going to catch anything if you don't keep the hook in the water. And I thought about that. There's, there's, a, there's a powerful application to that in this idea of soul winning, being a fisher of men. We ought to have hooks in the water, proverbial hooks in the water, if you will. And there are several different hooks that we can use to, uh, to uh, the hook is, is the gospel, if you will, but there are different methods by which we can communicate the gospel. One of the most convenient hooks that there are is a gospel track. And uh, I try to do our best to keep them stocked in the back there so that you can conveniently take a handful or or such and, and conveniently give them out at a gas station, conveniently give them out. You know, a, a delivery person comes to your door, you can have a stack by the door and uh, here's your tip and, and here's, a, here's the most important tip you could, ever, you could ever know. Something of that nature. Well, we gotta keep the hooks in the water. I wanna ask you this evening, do you have any hooks in the water uh, as you're trying to fish, be a fisher of men? One, uh, another cool method of fishing is is uh, using a treble hook um, and uh, uh, what's it called? Um, trot line. And <clears throat> the way a trot line typically works, it's a long uh, string, sometimes even a rope, depending on, uh, you know, catfish can get pretty big and typically you uh, will catch catfish with a trot line. And so typically it's strung from one end of a river to the other, or you can string it from one end of a lake to the other side or part way or however you want to do it. But on that one main line there, there are several hooks on that trot line. And so it gives you a better chance of catching more fish depending on how many hooks you have on there. And do you have any bait on there? You know, I think as Christians, we ought to have that trot line mentality when it comes to fishing for men as well. How many, how many hooks do you have in the water? What do, we, what do we have? The different activities that we do at church, they are all, they are all uh, ultimately, we try to gear them towards being hooks in the water. Um, what was Missions Month all about? Getting some hooks in the water. What is, uh, what is Easter? What is Easter all about? Well, the resurrection of Christ, but those Easter eggs, we're going to get, uh, get some people here. Some kids might like that, and and uh, we can preach the gospel to them like we've preached to our kids and, and uh, like we preach to everybody. If, if adults want to come, that's great. We'll preach to them too. But it's an avenue. It's a method by which we can get some more hooks in the water. And so let's have, let's have this trot line mentality of fishing when it comes to fishing for men. Several, several uh, hooks that uh, we can spread out there. I'm just going to name a few. And uh, so they... So they hopefully resound in our minds. We can preach in churches. Uh, we can have marketplace evangelism. Uh, there can be personal uh, soul winning. There's street preaching. There's dramas and musicals and cantatas. And there's television. There's radio. There's social media. There are books. There are gospel tracts and websites and counseling and businesses and uh, vacation Bible schools and uh, different areas and different methods by which we can get hooks in the water for the cause of Christ to reach souls for him. So one method of soul winning, though, that I think is, uh, I don't know, reign supreme, I guess, is a method that every church and every Christian must employ. And it's the primary method of winning souls uh, in the Bible. It is that of personal soul winning. I'm going to give you several instances of soul winners in the Bible. And people shared the gospel. They, communed their, they communicated their testimonies uh, of how they got saved. And uh, they, they lived in a way in which uh, they, the, 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 their testimonies were evident uh, that Christ was with them. And so personal soul winning. A healthy church is both an evangelistic and a soul winning church. I, I think I explained this Wednesday, but um, I think I might have, I told somebody that I was going to explain uh, the differences here. But uh, there are a couple differences here. When you think about a church, a healthy church is both evangelistic 
and it's a soul-winning church. What does that mean? Anybody remember from Wednesday? I, did I mention Wednesday? You came late, Randall, so I don't know if you were here. Um, an evangelistic church, what is that? An evangelistic church is a church that invites people. We want to continue uh, to invite people. We want to continue to invite people uh, to the house of God, but not everybody shows up when you invite them. And so it could be faulty in that aspect, in that, in that uh, if they don't come to church, they're not going to hear the gospel. The idea is to invite them to, to come to church and we'll preach the gospel and uh, Lord willing, people will call on the Lord and get saved in that way. But, but then there's the soul winning church. And the soul winning church is the church that goes out into the highways and into the hedges and preaches the gospel where the people are. Where the people are, where, the, because... Um, I, I, I read a quote, uh, I don't know if I got this quote here real handy, but uh, oh, I think it's later on in the notes here. But, but the idea of a soul winning church is going out, sharing the gospel where they're at, and uh, then encouraging them uh, to come to the church and, and get discipled. And so that's what a healthy church is. Uh, it, there's, there's a balance of the both. And so I think it's important to understand these concepts if we're going to be obedient soul winners for Jesus. And before we define this doctrine of personal soul winning, I'm going to share some things, just three facts of what soul winning is not. Three facts of what soul winning is not. Number one, it is not a gift to be given. It's not a spiritual gift. Being a soul winner is not a spiritual gift that you receive, somebody receives when they get saved. Amen? Amen. It's not, it's uh, some people may be better at, the gift of talking. Some people may be more extroverted than others, and uh, some people may be more outgoing than others and, and such, and I really have to work at it. I really sometimes have to psych myself up to, to talk to people and uh, to share the gospel even, but, uh, but it's not a gift to be given. It's a command to be obeyed. Um, and so we need to consider that. It's every Christian's responsibility. If you've been saved, it's your responsibility to share the gospel with others. And it can be very simple. We sometimes, I think, we overanalyze over the concept of sharing our testimonies. Uh, I want to do a little thing at the end of the, the message here. Can you remind me on if... Um, just wave your hand, okay, when you come... When I, if I say, let's bow... Uh, wave your hand, okay? Uh, because we don't want to bow. Number two, soul winning is not a suggestion to be considered. Soul winning is not a suggestion to be considered. It's a command to be obeyed. It's not a gift to be given. Uh, many try to live as though the great commission is the great suggestion. No, it's the great commandment. It's the great commission. Uh, and the only alternative to soul winning is disobedience to God. There isn't a command in God's word that's more straightforward than for his people to take the gospel to the world. Would you agree? Very simple, very plain. And the last words that he spoke uh, while, uh, actually, when he, after he resurrected even. And so, um, <clears throat> look at your neighbor and tell them, it's my responsibility to share the gospel. Go ahead and do it right now. Now look at him and say, it's your responsibility to share the gospel. Miss Linda, you, tell, you can tell Barbara or Susan, whoever's in front. It's all of our responsibility. Soul winning isn't a suggestion, but it's a, it's a command to be obeyed. Number three, it's not just the job of the pastor, the staff, the missionaries, and the evangelists. Um, and so we covered all that anyways. But it's your personal responsibility as well. I was, I was trying to be a, a, an obedient soul winner before I was ever a pastor. I was trying to be an obedient soul winner before I ever even uh, surrendered my life to serve God full time. Uh, I wanted to be an obedient soul winner. And uh, I think a pastor ought to try and lead in the way of soul winning uh, of sorts. But it's every Christian's responsibility to learn to be a personal soul winner. Now, here's the message here, uh, point number one. I want you to notice with me three essential facts about this doctrine of personal soul winning. And uh, let these, these facts here, they should encourage us to fulfill our responsibility 
to warn the lost and to win souls uh, for Jesus, to win souls to Jesus. And so number one, consider this, personal soul winning is personal. Personal soul winning is personal. Got to let that sink in. I'm telling you, you got to let that sink in. Personal soul winning is personal. It's a saved sinner telling a lost sinner how they can be saved as well. Saved people aren't better than lost people. Amen? Uh, if, you, if you've trusted Christ, you're not better than somebody that hasn't trusted Christ. You've, uh, you've been blessed to be exposed to the gospel and had the opportunity to receive it uh, maybe before they did. Maybe not. Maybe they've rejected. But uh, a sa uh, soul winning is a saved sinner telling a lost sinner how they can be saved. It's one beggar. I like this quote. It's one beggar telling another beggar where to find some bread. Um, the, the pop song. It's a nobody trying to tell everybody about a somebody who saved their soul. It's, uh, it's just that simple. Any believer can win souls, uh, and it's the personal work of every born-again believer uh, to do so. Jesus took reaching the lost personally. He's our example. In Isaiah chapter 61, verse 1, in his first public sermon in the synagogue of Nazareth, uh, where he'd been brought up, uh, actually, turn there. Turn to Isaiah 61. Isaiah 61. Say amen when you get there. All right, Isaiah 61. Jesus said this. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because, 61 verse 1, The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord hath anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek. He hath sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to them that are bound. To them that are bound. Turn to Luke chapter 4. Luke chapter 4. That was the prophet Isaiah, but this is the preaching of, of the Lord in uh, Luke chapter 4. And verse number 18. Same thing. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because He hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives and the recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, uh, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. That day, the Old Testament scriptures were fulfilled, and uh, the Lord began His ministry preaching the gospel. He came to seek and to save that which was lost. In Matthew chapter 18, Jesus told the crowd that they couldn't be converted unless they came as little children. In Matthew 18, verse 3, it says, uh, and uh, said, Verily I say unto you, except ye be converted and become as little children, ye shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. What did Jesus do? He was preaching to them. He was sharing the gospel. He was preaching himself. Uh, after warning the listeners about the dangers of offenses against little children, Jesus told them why he came. He said, For the Son of Man, in verse number 11, is come to save that which was lost. In Zacchaeus, he went to his house. What did he tell Zacchaeus? You must be what? Born again. You must be saved. You must be born again. Luke 19, verse 10. For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. Soul winning is the nearest thing to the heart of God. It's the heartbeat of God to save sinners. He took it personally. He reached sinners personally. He commanded the disciples to reach sinners personally. Uh, and he personally died for sinners. He was personally buried, and he personally rose again. And today Jesus personally rejoices over redeemed sinners as well. The Bible says there is presence in heaven. Uh, there, is, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner that repenteth. So, personal soul winning is personal. Jesus took it personally. Number two, Sinners get saved by trusting Christ personally. I, I know this is, this is uh, 
This is, this is elementary, but I think we can overlook this, okay? Um, sinners get saved by trusting Christ personally. Salvation is personal. What do, you, what do we mean by that? My kids, I can't save my kids. This church can't save my kids. I wish I, well, I don't know that I wish I, I could. I, I, wish that, uh, I wish that I could save people, but I can't. I can point them to Jesus, and that's what I'm supposed to do. Sinners get saved by trusting Christ personally. If somebody in here is saved, it's because somebody personally gave the gospel to you. Whether it was from a pulpit, whether it's at a classroom, or what have you, you were saved if you're saved because somebody personally took the time to do it. Now it's your responsibility, it's my responsibility to continue to personally do it as well. Um, all my sermons here I write, I, I have them pretty much typed out word for word. <clears throat> and so, yo mama can't save you. Yo daddy can't save you. Uh, you can't save your kids. Uh, it's an individual decision that each individual must make on their own, and each sinner without the Savior must pay for their own sin. And we saw that this morning. In Ezekiel chapter 18, verse 20, the Bible says, The soul that sinneth, it shall die. Uh, the son uh, shall not bear the iniquity of the father, neither shall the father bear the iniquity of the son. Uh, the righteousness of the righteous shall be upon him, and the wickedness of the wicked shall be upon him. Our kids are wicked. You were once wicked, and uh, if, you're, if you're saved, you were once a wicked sinner, but now you're a wicked saved sinner. Um, our kids were wicked sinners, uh, you know, um, and if they're saved, they were wicked sinners. Now they're saved wicked sinners. All that to say, they need to get saved on, the, on their own. Every individual needs to get saved uh, by somebody sharing the gospel with them as well. The Bible says in Revelation 21, verse 8, But the fearful and unbelieving and the abominable and murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers and idolaters and liars shall have their part in the lake of fire which burneth with fire and, and brimstone. Each and every one of us have a sin nature that needs to be dealt with. And somebody, if you're saved, shared the gospel with you. You personally received it. You've been forgiven. Praise the Lord for that. Let's tell others about it as well. Jesus died uh, for individual sinners. Hebrews uh, chapter 2, verse 9. Yes, Christ died for the world, but he died for you individually. What's the song? When, I, when he was on the cross, I was on his mind. Something to that effect. Each individual must personally accept Christ as their Savior. The Bible says in John chapter 1, verse 12, But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name, which were born not of blood, nor of the will of uh, the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. John 3, 36, he that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life, and he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. John 5, 24, verily, verily, I say unto you, he that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life, and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. Have you believed on the Lord? Have you trusted him as personal Savior? Thank the Lord, praise the Lord for the soul winner that brought it to you. Now let's go be fishers of men uh, for him as well. No one goes to heaven because they were born in a Christian family. Every individual must make a personal decision regarding the personal work of Christ uh, that he personally did for us. Number next, every believer should win souls personally. Every believer should win souls personally. Every believer should win souls personally. At least one amen. Come on. Uh, Jesus commissioned every disciple to take the gospel to the world. And we find a form of this command in every gospel, and in including the book of Acts. And some would say the book of Acts is a gospel as well. But uh, some people might say the Great Commission was given to churches. What are churches made of? 
made of people. It's made of individuals. This church is made up of the believers uh, that, that are assembled here, and it's our responsibility. If you're a member, it's because you've, you've been saved, uh, baptized, and uh, you've willingly decided to join the membership here. It's our responsibility to share uh, the gospel. Jesus gave the command to spread the gospel to individual Christians, and every Christian should be trying to win souls to Jesus. It must be of our utmost concern. Jesus has entrusted us with the truth of the gospel. Um, I got several instances here, and this is exciting. We are going to turn to it. Turn to John, John chapter 1. Excuse me, John chapter 1. If we don't share the gospel, it won't get shared. How many of you have figured that your uh, tax dollars don't go to sharing the gospel? And uh, they don't go to hardly anything that we want it to go to, right? But uh, especially that. Our government officials, uh, um, I don't know. I can't recall any that are busy sharing the gospel. That'd be awesome. Uh, and I know there are, there are believers uh, that, uh, that are running for office and such. And uh, I know one that I believe is a soul winner. But, um, but anyway, notice here. Uh, we've been entrusted with the gospel, and what a privilege it is to proclaim uh, the greatest story ever told. The angels would proclaim the gospel if they understood, if they were commanded to. Every rock on earth and every star on the sky would shout the way of salvation if God released uh, them the responsibility to do it. Yet, it's our great privilege uh, to be the bearers of eternal life and eternal light. And so let's take the responsibility seriously. Look at John chapter 1, verse 29. This is kind of a chain effect that takes place here that ought to encourage you, ought to get you fired up here. Um, and so I want you to notice an instance of the effects that personal sowing ought to have on a believer. Look at uh, 129. John the Baptist preached Christ by the river Jordan. And in John chapter 1, verse 29, it says, uh, the next day John seeth Jesus coming unto him and saith, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. And then the Bible says that two young men followed Christ home that day, and they trusted him as the Messiah. And one of them was a young man named Andrew. And then Andrew brought his brother Peter to Christ. And now skip on down to verse number 40. Verse number 40 of John chapter 1. One of the two which, were, uh, which heard John speak and followed him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. And uh, verse number 41, he first findeth his own brother Simon and saith unto him, we have found the Messiah, which is being interpreted the Christ. And he brought him to Jesus. And when Jesus beheld him, he said, thou art Simon, the son of Jonah. Thou shalt be called Cephas, which, is being in, which by interpretation is a stone. In the same chapter, uh, uh, it tells us how that Christ won Philip uh, to himself. And look at verse number 43. And then Philip brought Nathanael to Christ. The day, uh, let's see, verse 43. The day following, Jesus would go forth into Galilee and findeth Philip, and saith unto him, Follow me. Verse 44. Now Philip with a, was of Bethsaida the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip findeth Nathanael and saith unto him, We have found him of whom Moses in the law and the prophets did write, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Now I know different time frame, different scenario, different situation. Uh, they were looking for a Messiah and the Messiah came. Some believed on him. Those that believed went and told others. Now, the mentality is different in that we know the Messiah came, okay? There are those that aren't looking for the Messiah, but there are people that are looking for something. They're searching for something. They've got a, they've got a hole of no hope. They've got a heart of emptiness and, and no hope, and they need Jesus. They just might not know it. Trying to fill it with other substances, trying to satisfy the, the pain with uh, with different things and the hopelessness with different substances and things that'll never satisfy, and it's only Jesus that'll satisfy. We get that privilege to share uh, the person who's satisfied our soul and continues to do so and wants to give us a victorious 
Christian life. And then someday to top it off, we get to go to heaven. Doesn't get any better than that. What an awesome thing. Praise the Lord, we get to do this. Praise the Lord, we get to be personal soul winners. I know, I'm aware, my wife, um, I'm going to save that for maybe next week or something. I'm, I'm aware of this. Thank you for the reminder. But um, <clears throat> I want to encourage you, grab a, grab a stack of tracks. I want to encourage you maybe this week, reach out to somebody even on, how many like to get messengers, uh, messages from messenger? I don't. Uh, <laughs> uh, especially somebody you already think is your Facebook friend, and then they say, hello, got one of those from uh, Matt in the back this week. Uh, somebody tapped into his account, I guess. But um, anyway, <clears throat> send out a kind note. Send out an email. I don't know, what have you. I want to encourage you. I want to challenge you to be a witness for the Lord this week. Pray about it. Ask the Lord to give you boldness. Ask the Lord to put somebody on your heart that you can talk to, somebody that you can give an invitation, a gospel tract to, uh, somebody that you can be a witness and a fisher of men. Get that. Get some of those hooks out uh, this week for the cause of Christ. And so let's consider this, the doctrine of personal soul winning. Uh, let's all bow at this time. Father, we want to thank you for your...